each and every one of us has been affected in some way by the coronavirus disease pandemic, either directly or indirectly, and some even more than others. The more vulnerable demographic includes pregnant women, women in labor, and lactating mothers. Joining me on the show today are the ladies via video conferencing. Hi ladies. Hi guys. So good to see you. So ladies, if you were pregnant in these uncertain times, what would have been your major concerns? <sighs> guys, let me be honest, like the first time um, the president talked about this whole lockdown thing, you won't imagine the first thing I did was contact all my friends who are pregnant. And I don't even know what I was thinking because then the question becomes, they've also just had <laughs> the same way I've had. So I don't, I don't even know what I was thinking. So anyway, my greatest fear would be that the hospital system is overloaded and I'm not necessarily a priority fear. Yeah. So for me, I think my biggest concern would be one, you know how when you get pregnant, the first three months are very critical. If I were to catch COVID in those first three months, what are the implications to my child? What are the implications to the unborn child? Um, the possibility of a miscarriage, the possibility of a stillbirth. For me, those are the thoughts that come to mind if I were pregnant in this season. And then the second biggest concern for me is eventually if, say I carried the child to term and I have to go to the hospital in the event of an emergency say COVID has escalated in in Uganda what would happen if doctors have to be diverted when I think about that and you know even now without COVID my biggest concern as a pregnant woman if ever I were to get pregnant is will my doctor focus on me will my doctor give me undivided attention I, I absolutely agree. Um, my concerns would be slightly different being a woman over 35, um, pregnant for that matter. I would fall under the geriatric uh, pregnancy range, meaning we w I would be at high risk for both uh, myself and my baby. My biggest concern would be bearing in mind that I am already at risk going to a hospital and um, mixing with health workers, service providers who might be uh, already COVID-19 uh, COVID patients but are going through the incubation pay, uh, period, that would put me at um, additional risk as well. If I were pregnant right now, all I would know is that I'm, I'm, at, I'm at a higher risk and this is really because of my low immunity given the condition. So I feel a bit anxious like the whole process of pregnancy and childbirth is already blind and uncertain as it is and now to bring a whole load more of uncertainty you get eh? Ros V, uh, Rosethis, I actually was really I wanted to find out from you what have you been doing in regard to Botul's vaccinations have you do you have access to the health facilities in this regard I've really been what concerned about that um, I had to take her to, to the hospital. I, had, I normally go nearby here, not so far. But I'm thinking, I can't walk there. What do I do? Uh, my husband had promised he would get a vehicle. There's a mini, a, a mini van he uses for transportation. So I thought I would use his to take her. And then suddenly, it also breaks down. It needed to go to the garage. So I waited for him. I'm like, okay, so will we do this? Like, you know, this is not happening. So we have to push until next week and see if I'll have transport that week. What if I still don't have transport? During this COVID situation, which has been very unprecedented, COVID situation has not caused gender inequalities because COVID has only worsened the gender inequalities that have been existing. Why? Because... The fact that now majority women are in the lockdown, they can hardly access essentials like foodstuffs. They can hardly access health services to the extent that we have seen some women die 
on the road on their way to seek for services. We have seen some of them fail to deliver because of the background factors I talked about, the indirect factors, all the hard work they've been doing at home. And this, when it comes to with maternal health responsibilities, on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on how exposed these women have been in terms of whether they have been able to access nutritious food or whether they have been just working for very long hours without resting, it puts their life at risk. I still feel we should also bring in women that are outside Kampala, that are outside Wakiso, like the concentration has been, those in a, other local governments. And specifically looking at COVID, I get a picture of what the services are like at this time. First of before COVID, we've had situations where matern maternal health still has issues. We don't have enough beds, first of all, delivery beds at the health centers. Health Center 3 and Health Center 4 are still in dire situations in a number of places. Think about a pregnant mother, first of all, who has to walk kilometers away from her home to get to the health center and seek, it might be antenatal care, it might be going for delivery. If she doesn't have a contact of a uh, a leader in the in the in the district, for example, the LC1 or LC3 or RDC, who is going to permit her to move, it becomes a bit difficult. Even when some might have their spouses there and they are able to help, but they might not have the transport to take them to the health centers. What happens in such a situation? Her having to move with all the burden that she's in already. Let me now move to a mother who has given birth by C-section. She has to stay in hospital for about three, four days at least. And during that time, if you have over 20 mothers having to stay during that time, how is the social distancing being done? It's, it becomes a bit of a dilemma. There's no movement, which means he's not also getting some income. We are depending on a little we have in the account. So it has made us to reduce the food ration we eat at home, even the type of diet we have. We have to go on what we can afford, though you're supposed to eat certain. You have to balance the diet, but we are unable to do the financial problems. Being in the village, there is a way people perceive things when they say no transport. For them, they just take it, no transport. Like this morning, as I was coming to the hospital, I tried to stop over five borders but none of them was willing to carry me. Crowd, crowded places are not supposed to be there. And over that, when I come continental, I'm not the only one who is supposed to attend. And the very day I'm supposed to come, there must be also another person who is coming. And I don't know, and I'm not a lab, lab technician, to check whether this person is COVID-19 negative. Soaps are closed. Mostly where they are selling clothes. They have only opened these are tailors. They are not supposed to sell clothes, but they are supposed to make face mask. And this, the use of this face mask is also another challenge. Because as a pregnant mother, if you close your mouth, the part that you're closing is the mouth and the nose. You can even suffocate. Because you're not alone. Uh, in my case, I have had first hand um, information with two of my really good friends, um, Jeannie, who's having her first baby, and Nora, who's having her second baby with you know, her close family clo uh, uh, close by. Um, they have also gone out of their way with their spouses to ensure that they are, um, they are well prepared 
you know, with their mommy packs, the doctors know, the, I mean, the schedule, they're keeping in touch. They also did mention that they've gotten a lot of uh, great feedback and response from uh, the medical community via WhatsApp groups, via email, Zoom. Um, their doctors have been readily available for them. And it, in the event that they are not, there's always somebody who's on standby, you know, to answer those small questions, especially for the mothers who are having their babies for the first time. You know what? This is all really like it's coming alive to me in my head now that you guys mention this because I have a very close friend of mine, Florence Katono. She's in her third trimester right now. She decided to call the hospital and ask them if they could organize for her maybe an ambulance or if she, she could get a contact for an ambulance that she could call at any time, especially in the night, if need arose. And you know what the healthcare center told her? That, oh yes, there's an ambulance here, but at an extra charge. The extra charge was 150,000 Uganda shillings from Nalia to Buwati. One way, that's like under a seven kilometer journey. 150,000, isn't that robbery? That's like highway. I didn't, I didn't make sense because an Uber ride would cost me maybe a maximum of 20,000. So why is an ambulance that's offering emergency services asking a vulnerable woman to pay 150,000. I found it ridiculous anyway. I found that really, really ridiculous. The government has also stepped up and increased its budget. Remember there was a whole quarrel about why defense is getting more than health, but you know what? They did step up and they increased the health budget in fighting towards health care, you know? And maybe we could discuss about what you think that added budget allocation should go towards specifically in the sector of maternal health care. First and foremost, I would like to applaud the government of Uganda. If there ever was a time that I was so proud to be a Ugandan, this is the time. The way they have been able to pull resources together, to come together and, and work as a cohesive unit, I am absolutely, absolutely amazed. Because in the event, like somebody was like, oh, I ordered for an ambulance and it took, you know, a while. But the truth is that the government has gone a step further and availed government cars so that they can be able to act as pseudo uh, ambulances. For example, UNRWA gave about 40 pickups to KCC that are stationed in, the, in these different divisions that are just there on standby in case, you know, an emergency does come up. Hotlines have been opened so that people are able to call for help and they are receiving it. So even the person in the village is able to get at least that first line of defense in, in terms of, of if they really need to get to, um, if they really need to get uh, medical assistance. So to be honest, at the moment, I think it's very important for us to be beyond making suggestions that we should be able to applaud our government and what it has done for us. Oh yeah, that's, that's really something. I'm actually really thankful, and I was thankful even from the word go, to the, towards the Ministry of Health, for them in recognizing very, very early on that pregnant women were actually a vulnerable category and I remember they kept insisting that they should take the social distancing measures even more seriously like even more vigilantly but maybe just to add on because of maybe the issue of nutrition so generally lactating mothers and pregnant women they just to be able to give them everything they need to allow them safe access you know to what they really truly truly need because at the end of the day a mother, a pregnant woman, she's bringing life into this world. And it's our social responsibility to take care of that. The baby's done nothing wrong. So just, you know, to recognize that pregnant women in this time are an even more vulnerable demographic than we're really saying. And just to prioritize them, to give them everything that they need. That would be my, you know added suggestion on top of the great work that they're doing already. Exactly. You're right about that. And you know, after I thought of the pregnant mothers, my second biggest need was people being able to access food now that their economic activity has been put at absolute zero. And I'm glad, like, I've seen so many organizations, you know, give to the government. And, and now people can eat. But now this one, which 
probably many people didn't think about was for me my third fear during this period is gender-based violence and this is both women and men because people have not existed in their home family <laughs> unit <laughs> as a couple <laughs> for a long and extended <laughs> period of time without work guys like even for people who are not who are not violent normally in life just being there <laughs> with your <laughs> partner and with children in the corner that are shouting and screaming who are not in school man that does something to your mental health when you deliver your first of all send home before the child is immunized and in that process you may be coming to the facility two or three times before your child is immunized and in that process of moving up and down there is a transport problem you can't foot because the the conditions are not okay some of us have malaria and we are lacking blood i want to request our people to support us, let them help us and go to the village to support mothers in the village. Because others are there, they don't have even any alternative or any mind of saying that I should come to the hospital, I should come to the clinic, they don't have, and most of them are delivering at home. When it comes to with maternal health responsibilities, on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on how exposed these women have been in terms of whether they have been able to access nutritious food or whether they've been just working for very long hours without resting it puts their life at risk so i would like to say that government should consider even making outreach services health services working with the health center three working with the midwives, going to communities to where these expectant mothers are because the health workers in this COVID lockdown are more facilitated with transportation than women. So instead of the women coming to the hospitals, I think it would be proper if government considered sending nurses and midwives into communities to identify expectant mothers, get their data, and on time to time be in touch with them and see how they can be su supported. Because I think this is a more practical uh, solution. For a mother who was given birth by cesarean, she will be retained in hospital. But a mother who has pushed the baby and is home, how is she getting that? that the, the post care, post pattern care, is she really receiving that from the medical personnel? And I'm thinking of this in, in the rural areas, not the, the, here in the center, it's been a bit simplified. I could call a medical personnel and they come to my home and check on me, you're doing well, everything is fine, and they go back. I don't think we are providing enough assistance to these categories of people. I would also like to call, to call upon the government Considering the fact that women, majority women who work in the informal sector, have been in the lockdown now for almost close to two months, close to two months, to consider the stimulus economic packages that the government will give different women on a case-by-case -case basis, informed by the evidence on the ground. A package that can easily lift these women out of poverty, a package that can easily stimulate the economy and get people running again. This is a very critical uh, matter. I would also like to call upon the government to consider the need to provide internet connectivity services to all women across the board. Because we have seen during this COVID situation, for people who have accessible internet services, they have somehow been able to operate. They have somehow been able to order for services. They have somehow been able to market for their products. So 
So this is a very, very important aspect when it comes to lifting women out of poverty. Health centers lack mama kits and looking at financial year 2020-2021 budget, we have a shortage of 13 billion for mama kits that is required for the next financial year to help health centers be able to provide for the women that come to the hospitals to deliver. We hope that this will be fulfilled, this allocation will be provided to help in provision of the resources or materials required to help with uh, childbirth, but also an addition, an addition of 14.6 billion, I'm hoping will be allocated to help with sexual and reproductive health for the next financial year. I would also like to call upon the government as we move forward post-COVID to prioritize all these gender issues in the upcoming budget. So that issues to do with education, especially of rural girls, issues to do with economic empowerment of women, issues to do with participation of women in peace building uh, platforms and opportunities, issues to do with participation of women in leadership, the upcoming uh, presidential election, participation of women in leadership and decision making remains very critical if we are to address the long term effects of gender inequalities, exclusion and discrimination of women in the development arena. Share with us your experiences on all our social media platforms and make sure above everything else that you stay safe. With love from Bump Love.